The murder of 15-year-old Nicole Vanderhoek caused a significant uproar in her hometown of Eindhoven, Netherlands. Despite an intensive search to find her killer, there was insufficient physical evidence to identify a suspect. However, 16 years later, a Facebook comment would provide investigators with a lead, leading them closer to the truth and uncovering a twisted plot that would expose the killer. Eindhoven, located in the southern part of the Netherlands, is a vibrant city known for its innovation and technology, earning it the title of the City of Lights due to the annual Glow Eindhoven Festival. The city blends modern monuments with ancient architecture, symbolizing European living. It is in this city that the perplexing tale of our case begins. Nicole, born on July 4, 1980, in Erklands, Germany, was raised by her mother, Angelica Tegermeyer. She was rumored to be the result of an extramarital affair, and a paternity test confirmed that a married man from the same village was her biological father. However, Nicole never had a relationship with her father. A few months later, Angelica met musician Ad Vanderhoek, and two years later, they married and relocated to Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Together, Angelica and Ad raised Nicole and Ad's son, Andy, from a previous marriage creating a harmonious blended family. Unfortunately, the marriage was short-lived. Angelica struggled with severe mental health issues, often isolating herself from her family and battling bouts of depression. In 1989, when Nicole was eight years old, Angelica and Ad divorced, with Ad filing for primary custody of Nicole, citing Angelica's unfitness to raise their daughter. Ad was granted full custody and took care of both Nicole and Andy. However, as a musician, Ad frequently traveled, resulting in Nicole and Andy primarily residing with their paternal grandmother. Due to Angelica's mental health struggles, she and Nicole did not share a conventional mother-daughter relationship. Eventually, Ad met another woman, Yolanda Vander Weeden, who was also a musician. She appeared to have a good relationship with the family and soon Yolanda and Ad got married. Both being musicians, Yolanda and Ad frequently went on tour, leaving Andy and Nicole to be raised by their grandmother in Eindhoven. Nicole had a close bond with her grandmother and didn't mind this arrangement. In April 1995, when Nicole was around 14 years old, Angelica took her own life. Nicole was devastated by the news, as it meant she lost the opportunity to mend her relationship with her mother. However, her family and friends rallied around her and prevented her from falling into a dangerous spiral of depression like her mother. Ad did his best to comfort Nicole, and her friends became a support system for her. She eventually focused her mind and secured a job at a bakery in Wonstel. Keeping herself busy helped her steer clear of intrusive thoughts. According to her family and friends, Nicole was a good person, trustworthy, and highly responsible. On October 6, 1995, Nicol left her grandmother's house around 5 a.m. and rode her bicycle to work. This was her daily routine, and she never missed a shift without a valid reason. So when Nicol didn't show up for work, her manager and the bakery owner contacted the police to report her as missing. The police then reached out to her grandmother and father, who hadn't seen Nicol either, and confirmed that she had left for work as usual. The police immediately initiated a search, combing the area and questioning people about any sightings of Nicole or her bike nearby. It wasn't until later that same evening that Nicole's bicycle was discovered along the bank of the Domo River, but there was no sign of Nicole or her belongings. Considering Nicole's background, investigators began to entertain the possibility that she had run away from home, as some teenagers do. Despite the loss she had experienced and her extended family in Germany, Nicole's father, Ad, believed it was highly unlikely since she hadn't displayed any signs of rebellion or a desire to leave. The search continued, and on October 19, 1995, Nicole's backpack was found near the Eindhoven Canal. Investigators received numerous tips, amounting to nearly 300 leads. However, a significant development occurred on October 24, 1995, when an anonymous man called the police station claiming to know the identity of Nicole's killer. 
The call abruptly ended before it could be traced, leaving investigators with more questions than answers. This turned the course of the investigation upside down. Police intensively interviewed Nichols friends and family, carefully reviewing all available evidence in hopes of making a breakthrough. Yolanda, Nichols stepmother, reportedly sought assistance from psychics as the frustration of Nichols' disappearance weighed on everyone involved. The psychics directed the search toward two canals. Investigators used search and rescue dogs to thoroughly search the suggested areas, but no trace of Nichols was found. However, everything changed on November 22, 1995, when a hiker stumbled upon human remains in the woods between the towns of Merlo and Lyra. The hiker promptly reported the discovery to local authorities, who arrived at the scene and already had suspicions about the identity of the remains. Through forensic testing, the remains were confirmed to be those of Nicole Vandenberg, bringing the search to a tragic end. An autopsy revealed that Nicole had suffered two jaw fractures, head and finger injuries, rape, and stab wounds from a small knife that had also broken a rib and caused fatal internal bleeding. Her family was devastated, especially when they were informed that there was no evidence to identify her killer. Nichols' funeral, held on November 28, 1995, drew over a thousand mourners who wanted to pay their final respects to the young and beautiful blonde teenager. However, this was only the beginning of a long journey to achieve justice. Nichols' boyfriend at the time was interviewed, but as a minor, his name and photo were not released, and he was cleared due to a lack of evidence linking him to the murder. The police also attempted to identify the anonymous caller by broadcasting the phone call on national television in January 1996, hoping that someone would recognize the voice and come forward. Unfortunately, this strategy yielded no results. The case quickly turned cold until police made yet another discovery. They found another lead involving Celine Hardox, a friend of the Vanderhoek family, who was arrested in Miami in February 1996 for drug trafficking. During her interrogation, she claimed that the men she had been working for were responsible for Nicole's murder. Celine further stated that she was forced to become a drug mule to protect herself because of her knowledge of the crime. Initially, Ad believed her and supported her claims, but as time went on, her stories became less credible. Police questioned her further and were able to uncover the lies in her story. It turned out that she was simply trying to reduce her prison sentence, and Ad distanced himself from the story. Police then decide to bring in Ad and Andy in for questioning between May and June 1996 concerning Nichols' murder. After days of investigation, both men were released due to lack of evidence linking them back to Nichols' murder. Now, despite the growing reward for information on Nichols' murder, no relevant leads emerge, and the case grew colder. In 2004, another team of cold case detectives tried their luck, but their leads didn't pan out either. As the years passed, the case remained unsolved, and the family continued to struggle with the loss of Nicole. Andy, in particular, developed psychological problems, turning to alcohol and battling depression. He distanced himself from his family and eventually moved to England to escape the painful reminders of Nicole's death. Ad remained in the Netherlands, focusing on his music career and hoping for a breakthrough in the case. Ad and Yolanda eventually went their separate ways, with Ad moving to Spain but staying in touch with Andy through phone calls. However, the emotional toll of Nichols' death strained their relationship over time. The case took another shocking turn on March 8, 2011, when Andy posted a confession on Facebook, claiming to be responsible for his sister's murder. He was promptly arrested by British police, and while in custody, he made a similar confession. This led to Andy being extradited to the Netherlands for trial but there was no substantial evidence apart from his Facebook confession. When questioned about his son's confession, Ad surprisingly didn't believe Andy and thought he was seeking attention after the media attention surrounding Nichols' case. Yolanda was also interviewed but couldn't provide much evidence. The lack of evidence and the conflicting statements from Andy led authorities to exhume Nichols' body for further DNA testing. 
Scientists from the Netherlands Forensic Institute and forensic specialists from New Zealand worked together to separate and test the DNA samples found on Nicole's body. The case was reopened in 2012 with renewed scrutiny and investigation. However, the DNA testing and analysis were inconclusive, leaving the case without a breakthrough. As the years went by, the case gathered cobwebs, and the family continued to face the difficulty of not knowing the truth behind Nicole's murder. Afterward, a mathematical and statistical method was employed to determine a true positive match by comparing the prominence of DNA profiles. The three DNA samples were identified as male, and it was now the responsibility of Dutch investigators to verify the results against those of the suspects. Among the samples, one belonged to Nicole's then-boyfriend, who was ruled out due to a solid alibi from previous interviews. The second profile was allegedly unknown, although reports suggested it could be Andy. However, the police never confirmed these reports. The third profile provided interesting findings. On January 14, 2014, a 46-year-old man named Joss de G was arrested at his home in Eindhoven, a city in Helmand. Although finding his DNA on Nickel could have meant different things, the police continued to investigate. After extensive interrogation, investigators discovered that de Guy argued with his girlfriend on the day of Nickel's disappearance before storming out of the house. Connecting the clues, investigators theorized that de Guy might have encountered Nicole on her way to work and, in a moment of anger, unleashed his frustration on her. Although this was only a theory, de Guy had a history. He had previously been convicted of three sexually motivated crimes, including the violent rape of a 20-year-old woman whom he abducted while she was riding her bicycle and took to a remote area to carry out the crime. This scenario bore striking similarities to Nicole's case, except for the stabbing. De Guy also had incidents of sexually abusing an ex-girlfriend in her own home. Additionally, it was noted that De Guy suffered from mental health issues and had received psychiatric treatment during his previous institutionalization. The discovery of this new suspect indicated that Andy had been playing a dangerous game. After De Guy's name was added to the investigation, he confessed that the entire Facebook post and accusations against his father were a publicity stunt to reopen the case. Since Nichols' death, Andy had been devising a plan and exploring the possibility of DNA testing and exhumation. Over the years, he had approached the police to inquire about the requirements for exhuming and retesting the DNA he believed would be found on Nichols' body. For Andy, it was time to take action as technological advancements had improved since her murder in 1995. He was willing to risk his reputation to achieve justice for his beloved sister. Andy understood the importance of being convincingly persuasive due to the bureaucratic obstacles surrounding exhumation policies. He had to provide investigators with a compelling enough reason to retest the evidence. It was a risky gamble, but it paid off, and Andy was hailed as a hero for taking such a daring step. Nevertheless, the shocking revelation strained his relationship with his father, Ad. Nonetheless, they succeeded in bringing the man they believed killed Nicole to trial. The case went to court in April 2014, introducing a new series of unexpected developments as it progressed. De Guy's lawyer disputed the DNA evidence, arguing that other DNA profiles found on Nicole's exhumed body could belong to the killer. The defense further proposed that Nicole and DG may have had a consensual sexual relationship, highlighting her other sexual partners and the possibility of her being pregnant at the time of her death. In response, the prosecution countered these allegations, asserting that Nicole was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. They argued that DG, still angered from his fight with his girlfriend, met Nicole and saw her as an opportunity to unleash his pent-up anger. While the defense stuck to their claims of other DNA profiles belonging to the true killer, de Guy's trial for manslaughter and rape charges commenced on November 2, 2015. The prosecution presented two witnesses who claimed that de Guy had confessed to killing the girl. However, the defense argued that these witnesses were institutionalized alongside de Guy at the time 
and were merely confessing to exploit the 15,000 euros reward offered for information. The defense also raised concerns about the poor storage of DNA samples and advocated for reanalysis. Despite the prosecution's assertion that this was a delaying tactic, the court agreed to conduct new tests using a different forensics team. This caused a delay in the trial until the following year. And in April 2016, the new forensics team presented the results, confirming that De Guy was the most likely suspect. On October 12, 2016, the trial resumed, now equipped with the newly presented evidence. This process proved to be extremely painful for the family. The prosecution argued that De Guy should be sentenced to 14 years in prison for the manslaughter and rape of Nicole. They emphasized that given De Guy's background, there could not have been a consensual relationship between him and Nicole, stating that she would not have willingly engaged with him. After careful deliberation and considering the results of two separate DNA tests pointing to DG as the most likely suspect, his acquittal was overturned on October 9, 2018. He was subsequently sentenced to 12 years for the rape and manslaughter of Nicole. Following the conviction, life slowly returned to normal for the Vanderhoek family. Both Andy and Ad were proven innocent through DNA results, providing them with a sense of relief. Andy returned to England and attempted to lead a normal life. However, in May 2022, another tragic event occurred. Andy's neighbors noticed his absence and requested a welfare check by the police. Upon entering his apartment, the police discovered Andy's lifeless body on his bed. Surrounding him were numerous bottles of alcohol and prescription drugs. Toxicology reports later confirmed that Andy had taken excessive amounts of alcohol and drugs, resulting in a fatal heart attack. Investigators concluded that the stress of Nichols' murder and his relentless pursuit of justice had taken a toll on Andy, leading to his depression and eventual suicide. Given his history of mental health struggles, it was a tragic end to Andy Vanderhoek's remarkable and heroic story. Many regarded him as a man who loved his sister unconditionally and was willing to risk his reputation and freedom to solve the mystery of her murder. Not only did he help solve Nicole's murder, but he also assisted in removing a dangerous criminal from society, making him a true hero in the eyes of many.